consequent uh, uh, revenge and a consequent uh, danger of death to those people who have been labeled. So that kind of day by day action upon the whole population, harassing, pressuring, labeling, morally discrediting whoever you know in, tries to do something significant in favor of the uh, poor population is what I would call state, state daily terrorism. And I think this is in the long run even more important, particularly when it's mixed up with the other form of extraordinary events uh, of terrorism. And the third dimension of political terrorism in El Salvador is to look at it not in terms of individual consequences, but in terms of collective consequences. Certainly, I am a social psychologist, and therefore, I understand individual pathological consequences of people who have personally been submitted to uh, terrorist actions. Certainly, those people who have been kidnapped, those people who have been taken into jail, those people who have gone uh, tortured, those people who have been persecuted uh, as animals, uh, those people who have been threatened day by day, those people who receive daily calls by phone saying we're gonna we're after your wife, you're after your children, either you do this or you're gonna see. Those people who have been submitted to so many different, yes, certainly you can see uh, psychopathological consequences affecting them. And that's important, and my colleagues will deal with these issues, I guess, or some of those issues. But probably more important, even more difficult to uh, understand, is the fact that there are collective consequences of political terrorism. That the whole social life is affected by that kind of, this kind of systematic terrorism imposed upon the population by governmental planning and forces. It's what I would call the, allow me this word, routinization or the bureaucratization of political terrorism is a systematic attempt to force the population of a given country, in this case of El Salvador, to comply with a given project which is imposed even if that political, socio-political project does not take into account the basis, basic needs and the basic uh, uh, options of a given population. And in that sense, the whole social life is affected by this political terrorism which aims at a, an interiorization of fear. And there you have a population terrorized with interiorized fear who has almost no alternative but to comply with the political options that are imposed upon it. From 1980, probably since the late 70s, up until 1984, probably more correctly until 83, there, were, there, there was a campaign of political terrorism terrible in El Salvador. By the thousands, people were killed, were disappeared, were tortured, were harassed, were expelled from this, their, their places, and so on. But since 1984, with the coming of the so-called democratic government in El Salvador under Duarte, things seem to change a little bit. But the point is that things didn't change. What changed is the fact that there you have a terrorized population with only one option left, either to go to the mountains and to join the ranks of the rebels, or to comply with the project that was in, at least openly, that was imposed upon the population. And that was why, you know, your government was so satisfied saying, oh, 
you see the figures are coming down, down. Now, wonderful, huh? Wonderful. Instead of killing 1,000 people, you could say, yeah, only 700 have been killed, or only 500, or only 300. Great. As if 300 didn't matter. Probably they were not persons, human persons. They were animals, but I don't know. In any case, yes, there were less victims. But because there was less need of those extraordinary events, because people were terrorized, and in that sense, many people were paralyzed. But if you, if you go back to the events of these last years, as soon as the population recovers from that fear, and it starts again taking to the streets, demonstrating, asking for a name for their rights. Oh, again, the repression goes up, and political, a different, you know, that more open kind of terrorism goes up. Well, I think then it's important to take into consideration this complex picture of what political terrorism is, because if you only consider for political terrorism the people who have been tortured, or the people who have disappeared, or the people who have been uh, killed. Yes, you understand a phase of terrorism, but not a complete picture. And there is the danger of you know, considering political terrorism as isolated events, and not as it is, as a part of a whole political project. I don't think that the so-called counterinsurgency war that the United States and the Salvadoran government are conducting in my country, that the so-called, what beautiful words, low-intensity conflict, you know, I don't think it can be conducted without that essential part, which is political terrorism. And that's an essential element to that kind of war. So, what are the, the, some of the psychosocial consequences of this kind of political terrorism that is waged in a country like El Salvador. Let me mention some of them. I don't pretend to be exhaustive. I don't pretend that those are, you know, the only, maybe it depends on the situation, but I will mention some of the conse psychosocial consequences that I have and we have experienced in El Salvador and that, in my opinion, are affecting the whole social structure of our life. The first important psychosocial consequence is what I would call the narrowing and the stiffening of the general frame of reference for social life. Social life has become very rigid in El Salvador in the sense that you have very little alternatives. It's wonderful when you come here to uh, the Berkeley area and you see that, you know, there is that guy that believes such and such, and his, uh, his or her neighbor believes quite the contrary, and all of you put the uh, stickers on your car saying uh, uh, Renan is a stupid guy, and your, uh, your neighbor saying Renan is almost God, or, or, uh, and, and the one says I love Nancy, and the other I think Nancy is such and such. Great, and you, know, you go along, and it's okay. Well. Impossible to think of something like that in El Salvador. It's absolutely impossible because the alternatives are very little, very few. So there is a rigidity in the frame of references in which you have to live and, 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 and the options that you have in your life. And therefore, the life becomes quite a stereotype. People stereotype each other. And we behave according to stereotypes very often. Because otherwise, you can get into trouble. Because as you know, there is a, in, in, in the daily interaction in social life, people are asking themselves who the other is. And if you cannot identify who the other is, you rather don't inter interact with him or with her. So, Stereotypes become the way of knowing each other with all the bad consequences that this wrong uh, knowledge can bring about. And things like, for instance, 
uh, social justice as a value is El Salvador a subversive goal? So if you say that you aim at social justice, immediately they will look at you and say, you, you're a communist, aren't you? No, I'm not a communist. Oh, but then what? So social justice is a communist. Well, then yes, I am a communist. If social justice is, is, is communism, yes, I am a communist. Why not? A second psychosocial consequence, very tied to the, uh, the, the first one, is the social polarization and the forced, what I would call the forced moralization of life, the schemata, and common sense habits. 